So going back to that uh, definition from the ASNM, we've sort of gone over the central and peripheral nervous system part of the anatomy part, but it also then goes on to talk about signals monitored continuously. Uh, detection of, you know, detection of adverse changes enables corrective action and so on, but monitored continuously, so what does that mean? So now we're getting into more of the physiology and the modalities that are involved in actually utilizing that anatomy to record signals continuously during, a, during an operation. And there's a whole bunch of different modalities that are possible for us to run, and they can be broken down into two different categories. The spontaneous ones, which like EEG, are just happening, the body's generating these signals spontaneously, we don't provoke or do anything to elicit them. Uh, electrocorticography, which is an EEG recorded directly from the surface of the brain, and EMG, any kind of muscle uh, activity can be, can be spontaneous. EMG can also be stimulated, and this is the other category. So these are responses that would only occur subsequent to some sort of external stimulation causing them to occur, and that's EMG in a sense of a triggered EMG instead of a spontaneous one, somatosensory evoke potentials, motors, brainstem evoke potentials, and some of these other ones, which are less common. Uh, we'll just look particularly today at EEG, EMG, sensory evoke potentials, and the transcranial motors, and bears uh, a little bit. So let's go through some of those modalities then. So we've seen this electroencephalography again um, earlier. What's the definition for that? As we said, it's signals originating from synaptic inaction potentials, uh, which can be observed using electrodes placed in or on the scalp. Um, and again, EEG is recording of that signal from the scalp. Corticography is recording from it directly from the surface of the brain with a with a strip that's placed by the surgeon. So using the filters that we uh, have available, uh, we'll see different patterns in the EEG. What you can see here is that there's a mix of different frequencies. It's hard to appreciate, but there's one second delineations for so that this entire window is 10 seconds. And so you have something like this, which is kind of a slower response, and then there's some overlying quick activity to it. And in fact, EEG, is analyzed based on its frequencies, and it's broken down into four different frequencies, delta being anything that's four hertz or slower, uh, theta being four to seven hertz, alpha being eight to 14, around there, and then beta being faster than 14. So what we're gonna analyze with EEG is what are the constituent frequencies? Are they symmetric? This is left hemisphere and right hemisphere, so is each side of the brain generating about the same amount of frequencies. Um, are they continuous? This is a good continuous EEG. The, you know, drugs that you give can cause discontinuity and burst suppression. So these are some of the things that we're gonna be looking at when we're doing electroencephalography. Uh, this is just showing why we put the electrodes where we put them. There's a, a system of standardized measurements on the brain so that uh, the same patient can be recorded in a standardized way by different people using anatomic landmarks, it's called the 1020 system. And so using these uh, measurements, you can, you can uh, create a similar placement even if different people are doing the EEG on the, on the patient. This guy here in the operating room has sort of got, a, uh, he's skipping every other one, so it's kind of a double distanced array, but this is what it's based on. So this is what you'll see at the head. Uh, when EEG is used as a modality. So sensory evoke potentials, again, the ascending dorsal column, sensory pathway stuff. Uh, what's the definition for that? A recording of uh, volume conducted events, usually from the skin surface of the ascending pathway of the nervous system. Uh, dorsal column and medial lumniscal, you know, after it decussates. Uh, Activated usually by electrical stimulation at the wrist and ankle. We have good uh, access to very superficial nerves at the wrist and ankle peripherally, so that's a good site to stimulate. It allows you to get a good, a good strong you know, uh, beginning to the signal so that you can record it. Um, and then each, each part along the pathway, you record a deflection 
which represents a discrete anatomical site for that response. So here's an example. This is a, a median nerve that's been stimulated. And it's, it's different uh, deflections are broken down into three separate channels, the lowest one being a peripheral response from the brachial plexus, uh, then a subcortical response, sort of cervical medullary junction, which is recorded from one of various uh, non-cephalic electrodes, and finally a cortical response, sort of thalmocortical radiations and primary sensory cortex is generating this bump here. And you can see that the, the stimulation time is here at time zero. It's taken 20 milliseconds for that stimulation to get through the brachial plexus into the cervical medullary junction and up to the brain. And it's therefore labeled an N20 response because it's a negative upgoing deflection at 20 milliseconds. And that's sort of based on normative values for mass, you know, massive populations. That's the nomenclature, N20. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone's N20 is at 20 milliseconds, but that's just what that response is called. So patients serve as their own control. As I was saying, you could have an abnormal patient. They could have a neuropathy or any kind of other problem that's causing their N20. It's hard to appreciate here, but maybe their N20 is occurring at 22 or 24 milliseconds. So in absolute terms, it's abnormal by 10 or 20 percent. But we don't really care about that compared to what the normative values are of a general population. We just want to know, does it stay the same throughout that case. So they're their own control. So we'll take that abnormal reading into account and just say, does it deviate any further from there? So that's important to differentiate. So recording sites, um, again, for the cortical recordings, it's going to be at various areas of the scalp. And this is going to be based, again, on the homunculus that we saw. So if we're stimulating at the wrist, the wrist uh, representation is maximal sort of in this area here. So this is where we're going to sit an electrode so that we have it as close to that anatomic generator as we can to give us the best chance of recording that response. It's a very tiny electrical response. Um, so here you see that here. And again, it's based on some standardized ways of measuring using anatomic landmarks. You end up with SSEP electrodes here, here, and here. And if you were to overlay them with the uh, primary sensory strip underneath, you can see that they're essentially sitting right over hand on both sides and then sort of in the midline here. This one is good for recording the stimulation from the ankle. That's, you know, the generator and the, and the sensory strip is deep in the uh, convexity, so you can't really sink a depth electrode down there to get close to that generator, but you can sit one at the vertex and kind of catch it as it's coming up. And then those are referenced to a non-cephalic lead that doesn't really have any contribution from the sensory strip into it. That subcortical response uh, that we saw can be really generated from any one of these areas. So if it's, uh, and that's going to depend on what kind of surgery it is. So if you have a posterior cervical case going on, probably Indian and uh, any of these cervical levels are not going to be okay to use. They're going to be in the surgical field, so you're going to have to move that electrode either to the mastoid, the you know chin, front of the neck, somewhere like that. Um, so this is any, any of these spots, you might see an electrode placed there for the subcortical response. And uh, here's the sensory evoked potentials over here. It's a little hard to appreciate, but um, He's, he's kind of cleaning up, using some filtration to clean up the signals a little bit. But I want you to, what I want you to look at is, is when he starts a new set of SSEPs, which he's going to do just now, what you got, if you could see that, was huge deflections that were essentially uh, saturating the entire screen and didn't look like any kind of responses at all. And now after a minute or so, 30 seconds, now you've started to see these SSCP responses resolve out. Uh, the reason that happens is because, as I said, these are very tiny on the order of microvolt recordings. So any electrical activity uh, that's, that's present is going to really dwarf those tiny little signals. So even the EEG that the brain is making, the 
uh, electrical activity from the heart, certainly environmental electrical noise, are orders of magnitude larger than the tiny evoked potentials we're trying to record. The good news about that is that all that extraneous outside electrical activity tends to be random in nature. So with one recording, maybe it's generally positive. The next recording, it's maybe generally negative. Since it's random, it's going to tend to cancel itself out over time. The SSCPs that we're recording are time locked and occur at the same time after stimulation every time. So if you mathematically average several of these or a hundred of these together, the random outside noise is going to cancel itself out and the mathematically, uh, mathematically time locked noise is going to build up out of that background. So it does take a little bit of time sometimes to resolve out these uh, evoked potentials. And if the surgeon says, hey, how are the SSEPs? And you've just started a, a, a test and you've got all this noise in there, you, know, you can't give them an immediate feedback. So um, we work really hard to keep our signal to noise ratio as good as possible to really make it easier to resolve these out as fast as possible.